Thank you. Uh, it's really good to be with you. I've been thinking about what some of you are going through, and as I've been thinking about you, I, uh, I'm reminded of a seven-year-old I heard about from Pensacola, Florida. She was saying her bedtime prayers, and she said, Dear Lord, please help my daddy to get a new job. The job he's got makes him sick and tired. Thank you. Love, Cynthia. <laughs> some of you can identify with that, can't you? Looking for a job can just be exhausting. And I suspect some of you are sick and tired of the process, right? Well, in the midst of looking for a job, it's easy to become focused on just looking for a job so much that you begin postponing some other decisions that you need to make that have enormous implications. And that's what I wanna focus on for just a few moments. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of decisions that you've already made today, like, you know, what clothes to wear, what food to eat, uh, what project you might tackle today, or what phone call to ignore, or what comment to respond to, or what bill to pay, or maybe postpone paying. I'm not talking about those decisions. They're all important. But I'm talking about decisions that even are more important than those, that transcend those decisions, and I like to call these trajectory decisions. Let me explain. If you talk to any engineer, they will tell you that if you're trying to send a rocket to the moon and say you're within a half mile of the moon and you're off, say, one degree at that point, it's not that big a deal. But if it, you're on the launch pad and at that point you're off a degree, well, that's a big deal because you're gonna miss the moon by several thousand miles. That's why trajectory decisions are so crucial. Wise decisions about these vital issues will determine our true success or failure. So I'd like to talk to you about the most important trajectory decision you're ever gonna make. It's the decision of who is going to be number one in your life. It's no accident that God gave us the Ten Commandments, and when he did, he listed at the very top, the very first command, these words. You must not have any other God but me. Well, Jesus summed it up this way. He said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And just in case those who were listening didn't totally get it, Jesus added these words. This is the first and greatest commandment. So in other words, don't mess this up. Whatever you do, get this one straight. So what's the big deal? What's going on here? Why is God making this the top priority? Because it's a trajectory decision that will ultimately determine whether or not we successfully complete this journey called life. Some of you are old enough to remember the advice columnist who's deceased now by the name of Ann Landers. Remember her? I remember her once observing, life is what happens to you when you're making plans. In other words, we have this tendency to put off the big decisions while we're making our plans, while we're living our life. In other words, these big decisions we postpone and then one day we wake up and we ask, what happened? Where did time go? You see, the decision to make God the number one priority in your life is the most important decision you'll ever make. Get this decision right, and you will successfully set the trajectory of your life. But what does that mean? How do we do it? I mean, that's a big question, isn't it? Well, Jesus knew that we would struggle with this. So he deals with this when his disciples one day said, Lord, could you teach us how to pray? We notice that you pray a lot. Could you teach us how to do that? And so he gives them this very short prayer, very short. And, and we commonly refer to it as the Lord's Prayer. In that prayer, you'll remember these words. May your kingdom come, 
may your will be done. Now, initially, when you pray that or hear that, it sounds pretty tame, pretty non-controversial, until you understand what they mean. Do you understand that these are fighting words? I mean, these are words right up there with words like surrender, submit. It's, it's a prayer where we're asking that war be declared on the ruler that is presently sitting on the throne. It's a prayer asking that one ruler be removed and another ruler be installed. Or to put it another way, one king needs to be replaced with another king. Well, guess who the king is sitting on the throne that needs to be removed? Who is it that's acting like they have all the answers and have this right to act as king of their little universe? You know who it is? It's you and it's me. We have been sitting on the throne that rightfully belongs to God. And when we pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done we're acknowledging that God is the rightful king of our lives. And it's acknowledging that, you know, we really don't have all the answers. We really aren't the center of the universe. And let me share some really good news regarding this. There is something so liberating about not having to act like I'm the ruler of the universe. And I have found it very freeing to live with this awareness that there is someone wiser than I am, much wiser, someone who's more powerful than I am, someone who's more loving than I am. And I have come to love living under his authority and living under his protection. And I just love being able to call him my father. I love the prayer that the little boy named Carl prayed. He said, dear Lord, I'm seven. I don't know much. Please help me to be smart when I'm eight. <laughs> there are days that I think we all can identify with Carl. There's just so much that we don't know. In fact, I'll have to confess, I'm not nearly as smart as I was when I was younger. Back then I had all the answers. I, I, you know, I, but I feel like the bumper sticker I saw the other day that said, well, I used to have a handle on life, but it broke. However, there is something I believe with all my heart, no matter who you are, no matter what you're facing, the smartest decision you'll ever make is getting up off the throne of your life and allowing God to take his rightful position. And when we pray for his kingdom to come, when we receive him as our king, guess what? We not only receive him, we receive his treasures, his riches, his kingdom. You know, I have to ask myself, well, why would he even want me as a part of his kingdom? The truth is, that's a mystery I'll never know. Yet I rejoice that he's made it clear in his word that he welcomes me, he welcomes you to be citizens of his kingdom. I'd like to close with an incident I heard about the other day that took place some while back now in Plano, Texas. A guy by the name of Hayden Carlo, he's 25 years old. He was pulled over by the Plano Police Department because he had this expired license plate registration. As he talked to the police officer, he explained to them, he says, you know, I'm really struggling financially. And I, uh, I had to make a choice between updating my registration or feeding my kids. Not knowing what else to say, he said, you know, I, I know there's no excuse for this expired registration, but honestly, I just couldn't afford a new one. And he's feeling pretty hopeless. And frankly, he was a little embarrassed. And he simply said, you know, I, just, I don't have the money. It's either feed my kids or get the registration. Well, the officer handed Carlo a citation, but when he unfolded the paper, he saw a crisp $100 bill. 
Well, Carlos said, you know, I, I just broke down and cried as I sat there in my car. As he put it, you know, what else can you do? Well, Carlo took that money and was able not only to update his registration, but is also able to update his wife's registration. And when I heard this story, I thought to myself, you know, that's exactly what happens to us. When God confronts us with our self-centered behavior and all the things that we've done that we know, you know, they're wrong. We're, we're guilty. We know that. And we have tried to act as though we can be our own God. And we have acted as though, you know, there's some situations, I just don't need God. I can do this on my own. When we finally admit that, you know, yeah, I'm guilty. And I don't really have the resources to make things right. We're dumbfounded that God offers us grace, not justice. He offers us forgiveness, not revenge. We come to realize that, you know, he's not this stern, uncaring policeman. Rather, he's a loving father who truly cares for us. He cares for our family. In fact, he's a family man. And he sees who we can become. I'd like to close, if I could, by having the privilege of praying with you. If you would, bow your heads and let's pray together. Father, Right now, our lives are filled with so many decisions that seem so important. May we not neglect the most important decision of all, the decision to invite you to sit on the throne of our lives. So Father, right now, we open the door to our hearts. We humbly acknowledge our need for you and our desire to have you rule as the CEO of our lives. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.